Yeah, but that doesn't mean that they can use the things of that. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's what I'm saying.
Um, the advocates that we see here in Seattle, um, these should be familiar to most of you. Um, kind of broken up here, local, regional, and national. And advocates are those that, that sort of influence decision makers. And this is just a, a quick sample. It's a, it's a broad sample. It's not everybody. But we've got the National Trust for Historic Preservation, the Washington Trust for Historic Preservation, and Historic Seattle, kind of the like big three. Um, they're membership organizations. They're nonprofits. And then you have sort of, sort of local groups like Historic Volunteers. We try to kind of pattern ourselves almost after Historic Seattle. They're membership organizations. Um, they're nonprofits. They're, they're focused on saving places. Now, I throw four culture in there. So have people who have full four culture. It's sort of quasi-governmental. It's, it's at the King County level. They, they answer the King County. But they are so instrumental in funding um, historic preservation, local history groups um, through their grants. They advocate very much for preservation. So I threw them in on the advocacy side, but just know they kind of walk both sides of that line. And then probably not many of you probably heard of Preservation Action. I just threw it in there. It's, a, it's kind of a national lobbying group. They work very much on the federal level for um, legislative reasons. So that's kind of a basic overview of what we see in the advocacy landscape here in Seattle. Go ahead and just go to the next one. This is sort of the, 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 out, the outlook for government agencies here in Seattle. So when it, when it comes to preservation. Now, the preservation landscape seen on this slide, it was, it was basically the, the result of the 1966 National Historic Preservation <coughs> Act. And 1966 is kind of important for, for we historians because our cities, our American cities, have just been through urban renewal. And a lot of people were reacting to what they were seeing coming down, and particularly in our cities. So the National Historic Preservation Act was created as a way to a framework and structure to identify, document, and protect historically significant properties. It created the National Register of Historic Places, and they, they called it the nation's official list of significant properties worthy of preservation. The act also established state historic preservation offices, or SHPOs is the acronym. And these are in every state in the union. They coordinate statewide activities. Here in Washington, the, the SHPO is the Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation. So among their many duties, they have compliance and regulatory duties, but they also coordinate the state's listings to the National Register. And they also manage their own register, the Washington Heritage Register. And if you have time later, go on their website, um, DAH is their acronym, D-A-H-P. Um, they have a great website, lots of great information about both the National Register and the the programs they, they run, and then the state's programs. They've got really good um, um, resources for learning about architectural styles and lots of great photos. And it's a good resource to go on their website if you have, have time. And I think we try and move to it um, somewhat on our website as Fort Wallingford. So take a look at that. And then at the King County level, and because we're a big metropolitan area, we have a robust county level preservation office, and they also maintain their own register. Um, it's primarily in unincorporated parts of the county. The office, the King County office, also um, contracts with local governments in King County. The smaller towns that maybe don't have the capacity to do preservation programs, King County is there for them. So if you live in places like Issaquah or Kent, or or Auburn, your local city government may be working with the county office to run some preservation programs. So, so be aware of them. Does it really apply here in Wallingford, but it's good to know about. And then lastly, the city of Seattle. They run a preservation program as well, and they manage their own designation process. Uh, to date, they have more than 460 historic places in Seattle landmarked, and there are eight historic districts designated at the local level. So when we say historic landmarks or designated landmarks, we're talking about those that are officially recognized in basically any of these 
landmark registers. They've been deemed historically significant to the community, the city, the state, the nation, whatever. So I think the takeaway when we look at this slide is, first of all, that every level of government has its own register. They maintain their own register. Um, and the important part, what may be included on one may not be included on the others. So when you're talking with somebody about a designated property, you may want to kind of quiz them and say, well, what, what designation? Because you know, we'll go through a few designated landmarks here in Wallingford, but they could be on one or they could be on all of them. So a good question to kind of follow up with is, oh, great, which, which register are you talking about? So that's, that's good background. Today we're focusing primarily on the city's program, the register, and, and a little bit on the national register. Okay, go ahead. Just some, some basics about the register. Now, thankfully, all of those registers are similar enough to one another, and they use similar criteria and similar standards, but, of course, there are variations. So it's good to know um, when you're interested in a particular register to kind of pin down some of the, some of the basics and, and about each one. Um, for instance, um, the National Register generally, and generally, because there's always exceptions, um, generally applies to properties at least 50 years old. Conversely, the local register brings that down to, to about 25 years. So there's some kind of little differences like that among the, the many programs. So it's always good to read up and study on each one. Now, each of these registers uses three sort of basic concepts when looking at eligibility for the registers. Um, historic significance, integrity, and context. We all kind of know what historic significance is, I think. It's, it's, it's important to the history. Let's look a little closer at integrity and context. Now, integrity is, is basically, I like to think of it as authenticity. Um, and that's evidenced by the survival of the physical materials. So it doesn't have that historic fabric that it was, it was built with or constructed with. So think about the authenticity. Would somebody recognize that property today that lived and worked and walked by that property 50, 60 years ago? <clears throat> so integrity is about the physical authenticity. And then context um, should make sense. It's just putting that property in kind of a broader context. So if you're looking specifically at a house and then designating it, well, it didn't develop in a vacuum. You want to talk about the neighborhood context and perhaps the architectural context. Who, who else, who was involved in building it and what else did they, they do? So context and integrity are something that may be new to people not familiar with registers, but important to think about when, when applying. So what can be nominated? Um, more than you might think, actually. Um, these are very sort of government-y speak um, words, but this is exactly what the programs, um, the national and Seattle programs say in their, in their ordinances and their legislation. Seattle uses improvements, objects, and sites. They mean improvements, they mean buildings and structures, basically. Now, the national register breaks that down into buildings, structures, sites, objects, and of course, historic districts, which we'll talk about later. Um, structures are, are bridges, for instance. Um, sites can be battlefields or parks. Um, objects can be locomotives or, I guess here in Seattle, vessels, um, boats, ships. So there's a lot more than you might think that's listed in, in the registers. And you can always think outside the box. I think you're going to talk about that more later. Who prepares a landmark application at any level? And anybody can do it. Um, it's whether or not you want to. <laughs> it's, it's a cumbersome process, and but it, it, it's, it's designed for anybody to be able to do it. Some people think you need to hire a professional, and, and you don't. Um, you can, and many people do, but you don't have to. Um, all of those registered programs have very capable people working um, behind the scenes as staff to kind of guide you through the process should you want to do it yourself. So when we say a nomination form or an application, what does that look like? Well, I, I have some examples I can show you later if you, if you want to see one. There's zillions on the, on the internet, but, but basically it's a, it's a 
form with a couple of uh, narratives attached to it. And one narrative talks about the physical characteristics of the property, and the second narrative talks about um, the historic context and the, and the history of the property you're designating. So it's kind of taking yourself back to, to college, graduate school, high school, writing a term paper about, about the history of the place. So it's, it's a lot of work, um, but it's a really rewarding process once you get through it. And of course, the fun part is always collecting all the photos and maps and things you want to attach to it to kind of make, make your case about its significance. So once you're done with the nomination, once you've got it written, uh, what then? Well, it goes to the staffs of those agencies, and I'm, almost every time there's some, some back and forth, they'll have some questions, they'll want more information about this or less about that, um, which is expected, and it's sometimes a little maddening, but, but you want to work through that process, because after that, uh, the application is advanced to uh, a public board or commission. And you don't want to be going through all those things in front of them. You want to take care of it before you get to them. Now, in Seattle, that public commission is called the Landmarks Preservation Board. Um, in, in the state of Washington, that same, at the state level, that's the Washington State Advisory Council on Preservation. So each of those levels has sort of a public review process um, when it comes to designated historic landmarks. So that's the scheme on landmarks. Let's go through what Wallingford has designated. Um, there are seven designated landmarks in Wallingford. Um, two here, the Good Shepherds, and I've written down uh, what registers they're included in. So the National Register, the State, and the Local for, for I think both of these. Yeah. So these are well represented. Um, the home of the Good Shepherd were here today, and then the police and fire station down on 45th Street. Go ahead. Wallingford has practically all of the schools, I think, are designated in some form or another, and it's got several. Hamilton School was landmarked locally in 2006, <coughs> Latona School in 1998, um, Interlake, the, the Wallingford Center building. Um, is landmarked on all three registers. Um, and then Lincoln, Lincoln School um, was, is the most recently designated. It was, it was added to the landmark list in 2016. And then finally, the last one is Gasworks Park on all three registers. So this is what's listed in Wallingford. Um, do you see anything missing? I mean, if you were to look at this list, and you guys know Wallingford probably better than I do even. Um, what, what, what would you put on there? Well, the glaring things that I don't see, I mean, except for Gasworks Park, all of these designated landmarks are institutional buildings from the early 20th century. So there's no commercial structures, historically commercial structures, no houses, no residences. There's no religious buildings or churches. Um, and of course, no, no districts of any kind. So, you know, is is this representative of, of Wallingford history as you guys know it? Um, and that's just a rhetorical question. Don't have to answer that. But but I I've kind of been thinking about that lately. Like, gee, is, is this all we we have to? That's important to us here in Wallingford. Let's see a little bit. Go to the next one here. Um, when you look at other neighborhoods here on the north side of, of Lake Union, there aren't that many houses designated either. Um, I think I tallied, and I, I may have missed one or two, but there are nine houses landmarked in, in any register north of Lake Union here in Seattle. So we've got um, U District has two, North Fremont has one, Maple Leaf has a couple, Ballard has four, so there's, there's little bits here and there, but is, is that really documenting the history of Seattle either? So um, I think, well, let's look, at the, let's look at the historic districts a little bit. Do we see much residential architecture and history um, reflected in those? Um, on the left here, we've got all of, all of the historic districts um, designated at the local level. There's, what, eight of them? Um, 
And, and, and just to step back and say, districts are collections of historic resources. And, and it's usually a contiguous boundary around those. So there's a significant concentration of historic buildings within that boundary. And this is what the city of Seattle has designated um, throughout its history. The office in Seattle created in 1970-ish, and they started with Pioneer Square. So since 1970, um, eight districts have been designated, um, most of them more than 40 years ago. Um, just one has been designated in the last 30 years, and all or parts of all of them are listed in the National Register as well. Now, I see only one in this list on the left that's, that's um, purely residential in nature. That's the heart of Belmont. There may be a few houses in some of the others, um, but largely they're commercial districts or former military installations. So it's interesting to see kind of what, what, what's been covered in our local landmark districts. Um, when you go across to the National Register list, and this is just a, a quick sample, it's not all encompassing, but it was interesting to me, in the last you know, 10 years or so, um, there's been a real push at that level to, to landmark some residential neighborhoods. Um, Mount Baker and Ravenna Cowan Park are just this year listed, and what's interesting about those, especially Mont Lake, Mount Baker, and Ravenna is, Hundreds of properties are included in those districts. They're enormous districts. And um, the last two in particular are efforts driven solely by the, the neighborhood themselves. So it's just interesting to kind of see the two side by side and to see what's been documented and what we consider historically significant in Seattle. So I, I want to kind of bring my remarks to a close. I want to go to my last slide. I just wanted to throw this up. I thought this was really interesting. Um, our, our current mayor, when she ran for, for office last, this is about a year ago? Yeah, a year ago. Um, Historic Seattle always does kind of a Q&A with uh, people running for office at the, at the local level. Um, they, they posed a bunch of questions to the mayoral candidates, and it was great to see Mayor now Mayor Durkin um, saying positive things about neighborhoods and about preservation. So, I think as advocates, and I bet most of you are advocates, um, if you're here on a Saturday listening to me, you're probably an advocate, and I think we should perhaps hold her to her promises and um, see that we maybe designate a few more residences here in Seattle. So I want to turn things over to my colleague Susan. We'll go right into her program if you don't mind. Take a quick Save your questions for me at the end. So, as um, Sarah's mentioned, as most of you know, preservation has changed. We used to sort of think of what was historically significant, what maybe the most important parts of history that was written down, typically by the victors lives of the rich and famous, et cetera. But uh, over the last century, and certainly now, we know that history is much more inclusive, that significance is built on the lives and efforts of many different people doing many different things. And so uh, what we preserve and what we look at as landmarks is much more inclusive and it's getting more so all the time. Uh, it includes objects, as you mentioned, and here's some other examples of street clocks or statues. It includes uh, structures such as bridges, as you mentioned, but also some of the, what we call vernacular buildings. They're not high style, they're not necessarily designed by architects. They're, they're properties, uh, objects often that are used over and over and have a legacy within their community, such as the bulletin board, the Chinese community bulletin board in their international district. Uh, they can include modern buildings. I know when I did the landmark nominations for the space table and took it to the landmarks board, some of the board members were shocked. They were like, well, I remember when that was built. And they kind of were looking at themselves like, I'm aging in front of myself. <laughs> because we now look at the mid-century as part of our legacy. And it's historic, as you mentioned, 25 years is the cutoff of Seattle. So we've got some great, including Shannon and Wilson, which is down at 38th and um, Woodland Park. You know, we've got some great modern era buildings that really represent the, the 
construction changes and the kind of exciting engineering from that period. Uh, it can include building interiors. The Smith Towers within the Pioneer Square Historic District, but when its interior was threatened to be changed, the landmarks board designated portions of the interiors, which are so beautiful and special, having to do with you know, this incredible stone clad lobby spaces and those beautiful interiors. Uh, it can include really great uh, buildings that are associated with different uh, ethnic groups and immigrant groups, such as the Japanese Language School, which is a pretty plain Jane looking building, but was so important and is so important to that community and how it maintains and continues its heritage. And it can include some houses, and they don't all look really striking. Clearly, the Egan House, which is down near St. Mark's, and most of you have seen it, this kind of wedge of cheese shaped modern era house is identifiable. But I think if you went by this little bungalow in the central area, you wouldn't necessarily know that it's the home and studio of a really famous uh, Seattle artist, a sculptor. And uh, so there's, and then the Ellsworth Story Cottage is it's a little collection kind of under the floating bridge. Uh, really represents a kind of masterful work by an early 20th century architect. But they're very small houses, so they're not, you know, announcing themselves as a kind of grand uh, residence. So the whole varieties of buildings. Um, so I should work on, I've worked on, since the 90s, I've probably worked on like a hundred landmark combinations. And every time I start one, I learn something new about that community, that neighborhood, that organization, those individuals. And it's hilarious because the people I work with in my office will, will say, you know, these jokes, you know, who's your favorite dead boyfriend? Because we're always finding new architects <laughs> we fall in love with. Or uh, we'll come back and we'll say, you won't believe what I found. I was looking at this old newspaper about this and such. But look at this clipping, and suddenly some question that came up for us during research will be revealed as an answer, and it's so fun. So I know that history is filled with layers, and what we're doing now is not only preserving, but we're also adding another layer in our own lives. And so I wanted to show you some examples also of landmarks and the changes that some of them go through. Because a lot of people think, well, particularly people who are opposed to landmarks think, well, if you landmark it, I'm not going to get to do it. Or, well, let's remember, we don't live in a museum, you know. They feel like these are so restrictive that uh, it will inhibit their creative uh, impulses or their investment opportunities or their needs to grow their family home or their business. And, and so I, I try to show these next slides to people uh, as examples of changes to landmarks that have indeed been improved. Uh, one project that we worked on nominating was the 101 buildings that made up the historic Gessler Terrace. Fantastic uh, early public housing, pre-World War II. Most of it had been changed incredibly and had lost its integrity. Most of the buildings had. But one that hadn't was its uh, steam plant of all things, a kind of industrial building. And that has been, while most of Gessler Terrace is gone, that's still there and it's been rehabilitated with changes on the secondary sides to bring in new pe bring people into the new Epstein Opportunity Center and another community-based building. Uh, this was a building that my office was in for a long time. We were up here when South Lake Union had no one in it. <laughs> <laughs> there was one place to eat, and, uh, very quiet, you just park on the street, no, no fees, and uh, now it's the Ray Horse Tavern, and, and you can see it's sort of surrounded by all of the mega Amazon buildings, but it was preserved in fact. Uh, the Lake Union Steam Plant is really dear to my heart because this is the first building that I wrote a landmark nomination for, and there was a proposal to put housing in it, break up all the floors, put little uh, balconies in and out. Uh, that was defeated through an appeal process. And then Cymogenetics, this biotech company, came in uh, and took it over. And um, you know, they were able to use this volume. They did change the windows out, but they kept their floors back. And, and of course, some of you know that the stacks are not authentic stacks, but they were put back. And so it's a really, it's all about public power, uh, literally and figuratively, and everybody can still see it. Um, 
Volunteer Park has, you might, this is kind of a dual layer because Volunteer Park and Olmsted Design Park from the early 20th century in the 1930s received the um, Seattle Art Museum, which is a private nonprofit organization, it's not a city organization. So here's a layer, and now recently, through some controversy, the museum is expanding on the backside. Probably most of you know the Fremont Trolley Barn, mm -hmm. which uh, when it was first rehabbed was the Red Book Brewery. That's what these photos show. No, these don't. These are of Teo Chocolate. So if you, mm -hmm. if you want to take a look at where the trolleys used to be uh, serviced, take a tour of Teo's and you'll get free chocolate. Mm -hmm. um, I worked on a landmark nomination for a three part uh, laundry building some time ago the, uh, that was built in starting in 1909, 1920s, and 1940s. Mm -hmm. This is in the South Lake Union area, and um, the, it was acquired by a developer who saved portions of those buildings um, and built housing behind it and turned portions into townhouses. Um, when you mentioned advocacy, I think it's really important to recognize there's non-advocates. Not only the people who are suspicious of what will the restrictions be on me, but with, our, with the development we see in Seattle, there's just so much money coming into the city, and people want to take and change things and maximize. And we see that all over the city, where you, if you knew what the zoning was, and you blew up a balloon within that envelope, that's what they want. And so, um, these, a lot of these newer changes, I think, do represent compromises to recognize what the city wants. The city's through zoning is saying we want to densify and make things more accommodating for more people, and the restraint that uh, preservation puts on things. This is an apartment building on uh, Queen Anne that received a penthouse quite a large penthouse, and then on the other side it received these uh, townhouses that were designed to meld with it. Um, you know, projects like these are really controversial, and they're not only controversial for community people, but they're controversial for the applicants in the, I mean, this project we worked on at my office as designers, and then we went through the front because we just thought, we don't think this is the right thing to do. So there are all kinds of choices that go on in these things, and I think it's really important as we, we work on controversies, and this is certainly can come to all of us, to recognize the, uh, the rightfulness of the, of the opposition, that they felt like they needed to make the return that they did by this increase in the penthouse. But, it goes just one more second, but luckily, this beautiful apartment building uh, is well preserved and kind of represents Queen Anne Hill circa 1909. We see the additions to the public libraries uh, and the changes to those. The one in um, Fremont, that's another one my office worked on, it didn't receive that many changes, although there's accessibility changes to allow for access to the lower floor. And then some of the other buildings, such as the Douglas Truth Library in the central area, received a new addition and the lower floor was expanded. And the new addition is, you know, it, it's carefully attached and reads as something new so as to not confuse people, but it's quite dramatic architecture. Uh, and here's another example of an addition to one of the city's modern era libraries. This is the, we're looking at the back side here of the Magnolia Library, this beautiful Paul Kirk design library in Magnolia, which if you haven't seen it, it's really my favorite, and the very, here's the interior of the historic library, and the very sensitive addition to expand the public room and make it accessible that's on the back of it. And both are quite beautiful. The uh, Cobb building downtown was built in uh, 1909 as a medical dental building. It had all kinds of great services, uh, shafts to bring in air throughout it had a, a roof terrace uh, for people recovering from <coughs> small surgeries and it was rehabilitated recently with pretty few changes to the exterior to um, to become apartments uh, with commerce at the base 
And um, here's another great example in the um, international district. There were these two buildings. The Kong Yek buildings were built by uh, an investment group of Chinese immigrants. I've been doing a lot of work in the IV, and I know that the reason we have this really great multi-ethnic neighborhood, it really represents exclusion. Um, you know, initially Chinese people, then when the immigration laws restricted them, Japanese people immigrated, then when the internment came, and these aren't exact figures, it's all kinds of stuff. Filipino people came because of the, they were US citizens. Uh, the Philippines was a territory after the uh, Spanish-American War, and then more recently, Vietnamese uh, people on the east side of the freeway, and so that historic district's been expanded to be more inclusive. And um, each of these groups came and faced incredible restrictions in terms of where they could live. You know, terrible discrimination, um, as had African-Americans in the central area. But this was a neighborhood that represented uh, tolerance and acceptance of all groups. And so uh, this investment group that couldn't purchase property elsewhere built these two buildings, one of which the Eastern Kongyak building has uh, been incorporated to become um, the Wing Lung Museum. And it has, uh, if you get a chance to take a tour there, there's an apartment building upstairs in what was once a, a, a hotel that really gives you an authentic sense of what it was like to be an immigrant family living in the international for the decades. Uh, other examples that you may know of, like the Good Shepherd Center with its chapel, include uh, Town Hall, which was is a first hill in a um, former uh, Christian Science Church, and Washington Performance Hall that the uh, Historic Seattle took on as a project uh, that's become a performance hall. Uh, we see some buildings that really, this is a building, it's kind of a bad photo, because it really doesn't show in the context of, it's right next to other buildings. So I worked in the nomination of this building, and it was just a very simple efficiency apartment building. They had this pretty art deco facade. That's really all it had to work for, was this beautiful art deco facade. It's downtown in the uh, but it was rehabbed for uh, affordable, low-income housing, and one of the things that was inserted into it is the urban rest stop. Um, so it's an agency-owned building that uh, continues to serve uh, as a multifamily building. Uh, we do have historic districts, and they represent, uh, you know, different specificity, but some of them receive new buildings. Um, Pioneer Square, really built right after the fire, looking to Chicago for the ideas of masonry buildings and replicating these, which are, which are called Richardsonian Romanesque style buildings. The liveliest place in the city. And, um, you know, it's gone through ups and downs of uh, uh, despondent kind of economic conditions and different uses and revivals and um, nightlife and the domes, uh, very vibrant. And uh, one example, I think it's kind of striking because it's so large, is the insertion of the new warehouse we're building on uh, what was called a non-contributing site. That was a parking lot site across from the um, Occidental Square. And so you see in these historic districts, you see buildings that are primary contributing buildings that are really important. And then you do see all kinds of just buildings or parking lots that aren't contributing. And typically in historic district, those are the ones that can accept new, new development. And then of course we've got our own home of the Good Shepherd. I love work, my work on this building with my former business partner, Bob Wagner, for like 12 cases back starting two long ago. And I just love finding out about the history. Because you know, it was built as a, a place for bad girls. And then um, I always say that in the 70s, we ran out of bad girls. <laughs> so it's always been this, yeah, these wonderful, I mean, when I started working at it, it was uh, artist studios upstairs, and the artists had taken over all kinds of things. And Chuck Green had done that great stonework at the corner, and there were
there were chase lounges made out of soil and grass around the field and pool. But, so it's gone through lots of changes as historic Seattle gained the funds to go up and finish all of the rehab. And um, it has so many wonderful uses here. It's just a fabulous project and resource for the community. Okay. So we're on for questions now. <laughs> Do you know anything about Beaux-Arts? Well, I know the Beaux-Arts style is kind of a neoclassical style that was popular um, throughout the U.S. Um, in the village. Oh, Beaux-Arts Village over in Bellevue. Well, I've been there once, and it's sort of striking to me because, you know, I, like most Seattleites, I certainly go to Bellevue, you know, I maybe go there to shop or something, but, um, you know, it's a pretty wonderful little community with, Old, older, early 19th century houses. Uh, yeah, it's a lot of houses. Exactly. But we're losing a lot because people keep buying the beautiful mid century honor, tearing them down and building this stuff. Well, I mean, that's what we it's, see as, as we walk around Wallingford. We'll see what used to be. I mean, that's what's so great about Wallingford is when we're talking about what's missing. Are these uh, typically, it's a streetcar center. Right. And then you'll go, and you know, I live on a street that's L1 or Tucson, and so uh, all the little marginal, you know, they weren't really nice crash with bungalows, but they were marginal early 20th century houses. They're all gone. The larger ones are there still. They've been replaced with town houses. So we, we see that. And that's one of the things I think you might want to talk about in terms of to continue that, would you talk about the status of when of Longford as a potential historic district and what's left to save and where it is in process? Oh, well, maybe we can yeah. talk together yeah. about that. I mean, if you look at Longford, so the gas works plant was sort of the early major industry here, and Longford was an industrial area at the south end. A lot of the houses were developed were, were for working class and small. Houses for, for people who worked close by in those, those shipyard industries and then the gas works plant. So the streetcar then developed up north and up clear to, to Green Lake. And so along those spines through the neighborhood, we, we can see kind of a, a story develop. And you know, those are the areas we might want to look at if, if, if there ever becomes. Um, an effort to landmark. Look, look along, start there, look along the, the streetcar lines and pick out the little commercial building that developed along it. And um, so, a brief announcement whoever owns the Chevy Volt Silver C35472G, it needs to be moved. Good. Uh, is that you, sir? So, um, in terms of Districts. The city does have these eight districts, and as you mentioned, three or four of them were community-based, and they're in residential areas. And uh, they tend to be in residential areas that are very cohesive. Nearly all the buildings are like this, you know, houses, houses from this era, organized maybe around a park. Such as in Verona Park or Mount Baker. Mount Baker was a their their neighborhood is a planned development. Right. All of the flats are are a pre-drawn flat and then developed. Right. And Here it's that. very organic and yeah. developed in pockmark. You know? And that's why in Wallingford you see like streets widths are different. So sometimes there's streets that are yeah. angled. Like I lived out in Ashworth and as you turn onto it, it's kind of there's sort of a wider part and it straightens out and there's little Dorothy place and there's a little car place and you know these are little plots that a developer might buy a bunch and plot it out. This guy wants to make big lots and sell them more expensively. This guy makes little lots. I mean it's yeah. kind of great because it's a very interesting yeah it's, it's organic and if you look at um, the the plat maps from the from the early 1900s it's it's all over the map. They just developed as a little parcels, you know, 10, 15 lots, maybe a little bigger, and um, it's not like your Ravenna or your <laughs> or your Mount Baker. So in that in that sense, it's a little different. But and it's um, a little more difficult too because yeah. I think the theme then. I mean, you can't say the historic theme includes all layers. 
that's just not going to carry enough weight for people to understand. So if you are interested in the district, I mean, my advice is um, you have to gain the support of the people who own these properties. And that's hard, because a lot of people might want preservation or think, well, I'll preserve my home, but I don't need the government telling me what to do. Um, you know, that's why we don't have a lot of districts. And there's no magic number. I used to think that you had to have at least 60% of the property owners sign on, but I know now that if you have one or two property owners who are powerful and oppositional, they can up in the whole thing. And so if you're interested in a district, I would urge you to look at the area of Wallingford that is the most cohesive, that has more of the dwellings, for instance, that have been preserved. And you can just tell by walking down the street, these people love their houses. Mm -hmm. And, and they, they don't mind the restraint of keeping an older bungalow that may not have a second story um, view roof deck. You know? um, and work to see if the values that appear to be represented can be represented. And the thing about districts is districts come with their own guidelines that are specific. You know, they could be prepared that the design reviews that go on are only about the fronts of the buildings or what can be seen from the street. They, they can be um, as descriptive and as restrictive as the people preparing the district nomination want. And would you say, so those residential districts that have been listed in the National Register recently perhaps they are moving toward the National Register because there are less restrictions. Right. And I think that's that's telling in that right. list is we're not seeing a lot of that activity on the Seattle side because of those design guidelines and, and potential restrictions. Right. Whereas on the National Register side, it's, it's purely honorific at this point. Well, so and it does protect a neighborhood from uh, if there's federal actions or projects like a freeway expansion, right? It, it will be forced to avoid impacting that historic district or that National Register property. But the downside of the National Register, people think it's just so great, they've spent all this time working to get this, and then it can be torn down the next day. You know, so it's 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 at a different level. In some ways, it's uh, harder to get on and more difficult and offers some really strong restrictions. But in other ways, if you really want to preserve things, Seattle landmarks. I mean, it's a very strong regulation. Um, it, it involves design reviews by the Landmarks Board of proposed changes. If someone says, oh, but I need to tear it down and they haven't really thought it through, the Landmarks Board will force them to demonstrate that they've looked at alternatives. Um, and they do this with a real professional scrutiny so that it's a really powerful um, vehicle to maintain things. Do you know if anything is being done about the movie theaters on 45th? The movie theaters here? On 45th. I don't know if there is, and I haven't seen anything. You know, we have neighborhood uh, blogs, and um, you know, the people focus on, there were uh, downtown theaters that were identified and saved in a big effort after the music hall was demolished. There's all this focus now on the show So So um, Paramount is the name of the list. It's probably National Register. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. It is. She's asking about the, the 45th Street. I know, right? Right? Yeah. You just said no, downtown. No, right. Fair right. amount was a huge effort. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. Um, so it really depends on people's passions for, I want to see this. You know, and I don't know. I know one of the theaters is newer and one is older. Um, and there's there are other theaters, like the Art which is in uh, Columbia City. The, um, Admiral in West Seattle and the Guilford Fifth have all been saved largely by community efforts. So I was going to ask the same, actually, the very same question. Even though we're Connection, not. I said. I meant to say. Not Sorry. Yeah. Even though we're not owners, are we able to, as a group, apply for designation for those two? Even as an individual, you can do it. Yeah. I, I do know, and then you can help me with this, I do know. Um, maybe three years ago, where the owner of the property put forth an application that was denied. Okay, so that's one thing no, that you should know. But that application was a fraud. No, listen. No, but it was a fraud. Please, and it was please, <coughs> please let Susan. Well, 
Well, I don't know if it was accepted by the staff. When you write a landmark nomination, it goes to the staff and they review for adequacy. It's, does it have, well, we'll take your comment just a sec. Does it have enough information? And if it does, then it goes before the landmarks board. And it can be brought up by anyone. And I work with nonprofits, individuals, government agencies, and I work with developers. And quite a few of them want to find out, and this is what I advise them. If you don't know, then submit this nomination and allow the board to review it and decide. And a lot of people think that you have to be pure of heart to do a nomination and be advocating for it. What they're advocating for is a decision, is to have the status resolved. And so, um, you know, I don't know anything about the nomination of, of that property. Maybe you want to comment on well, that. Well, I have a copy of it somewhere in my yeah. files, and I talked to both the people who did it and the landmarks people. And it was put in with all in, with the intention of getting turned down, so they wouldn't have to worry about it. It was but, not put in as the intention of getting landmarks. Right. Well, that's what I mean. Is but the the landmarks ordinance says that the board is to consider the integrity, <coughs> right, right, and look at six different criteria having to do with association, significant association with an important person, with a significant event, uh, architectural features that are representative of a style or period of construction, the work of a masterful uh, architect, designer, builder, um, I'm going to miss one, <laughs> the um, historic associations, and that's a more general one. It says it has to be significantly associated with a significant aspect of the, um, I'm sorry, I'm reporting exactly right. I think it says uh, community, city, state, or nation's economic, social, or political heritage. And then the next, the last one is a physical landmark that is identifiable by its scale differentiation. It, you know, it might be like, you want to get to my house, go to the big church tower, and turn left, and some of you can see. So the board is a quasi-judicial board. It can't talk to individuals outside about these issues. It's not advisory, so it's a really strong board. So I think uh, um, the they're always being watched by the city attorney. I think for the most part, they largely look at those criteria and judge it. And, and well, I it was turned down. One of the reasons it was turned down was because of modification to the interior. The modifications to the interior were made for handicapped access. Mm -hmm. And so there was a number of things. In, and I, I also have a, a person that we actually work with sometimes who is a uh, who is a, a preservationist, but he's not a professional like you all. He said it happens every day that people are submitting these things with professional support, but the intention of them fail so they can well, develop the and, building. And it's heartbreaking when you take something to the board and see them not act on it. Or uh, when you go, it's a public forum, you'll present your information and then the public speaks. And some people, the public, will say things that you know aren't true, but your time is up. Or the board members will see something differently than you do. And it's, I, I mean, I, I know the pathos of that. Yeah, exactly. I've been in that position, but I've been in that position before and against buildings because I think that as, a, as somebody who knows, I can speak with the information about this. But the board is broadly representative of ad hoc members who typically come from the preservation community, architect, engineer, real estate, uh, financing. In fact, they have openings for mm -hmm. three, three yeah. board members <coughs> who are interested, you know, and they do take public testimony. I mean, there's Leanne Olson from the Queen and Historical mm -hmm. Society, who just recognized by Historic Sale. Mm -hmm. She goes to every single meeting mm -hmm. that involves Queen Anne, and she's, she's articulate, and knowledgeable community member, she speaks up, both for and against things. You know, she'll tell them what she thinks and knows, and that kind of input, I think, is really important. I want to get back to your question, though. Um, any of us today could put in an application for the National Register for the theater building. Nothing's stopping anybody from doing, right. that, from doing that, so. But again, the staff, but the DHP, adapt will review it to right. determine whether they can support it. Right, exactly. Um, and then once something, if it goes through the local landmark process and is denied, that puts it on hold for five years. And during that period, they can't consider it again. But there have been 
for instance, back in the mm, 80s, I think it was, a lot of the schools went through, and uh, one of them was Franklin High School. And at that point, the board said, it's changed too much, just like you're talking about changes to the building for all kinds of good things. When I was on the board, we, the philosophy had changed about it. And we went and looked at that school, uh, brought in by the community, uh, who wrote the, a revised nomination, and we, when I was on the board, determined it was eligible. We a period change, the bus did change, the understanding of what's important uh, had changed. So it's discouraging. It's very discouraging when you work and feel one way or the other about something to see a public discussion not agree. <laughs> Anybody who goes to any of these boards, could it decide? Um, could it decide? No. Not just the facade only, but for instance, remember I showed that um, Art Deco apartment building in El Rio mm -hmm. and mentioned that it didn't really, in my view, have a lot going for it other than that. But it's a beautiful facade. It's a, the facade clearly represents a, an apartment building with lots of small units in it, which it was an efficiency unit. So uh, if it was a facade, something that was completely different on the inside, it might be more difficult. But what about the line for bungalow? But you, what do you think about the line for bungalow as the community of the town? I'm switch one? The line for bungalow. The longer for the bungalow. As a type, as a building. Well, type. as an area like the Pasadena. Yeah. Why, yeah. What about that? Why because when I you talked we, about it earlier, I believe Sarah talked about it, was it was sort of cherry picking the big houses along the uh, like Burke. The, the the no along the uh, trolley line. Right. But the but I would really like to see us work on the whole business yeah. of, of a major so effort to get, yeah. just like we're going to show them. Uh, well, Tom Heath is going to talk about that, and I really think that that's what, when I think of Wallingford, I think bungalow. bungalow. And you think, you know, the significance may not be in just one bungalow, but it's the collection exactly. that makes it so exactly. important. Yeah. So I think that's, that's what the historic district will make for. Yeah. Right. I think as a, as a way to, um, you know, I think districts typically have, uh, less burdensome restrictions mm -hmm. because they're trying to save the whole mm -hmm. collection. Mm -hmm. It's uh, and the um, the significance of each individual building as you were saying. Right. It doesn't have to hold everything up. Uh, um, but that's what I think is so great. And Tom is going to talk about his survey next and, and all the discoveries that he made about that. But I think that's really the way to go for Longford's residential area. Yeah, and the, we're going to show the Pasadena bungalow right. here, and we'd like to have some new experts come and talk. Ron, do you have a question? Susan, do you know anything about conservation districts? I know a little bit in that uh, the conservation districts we have in Seattle are, it's really a misnomer because it, it's about character preservation. Because somebody bumped it. It's a conservation district that's in Pike Pine. And that was not developed oh, by Landmark's staff or the Department of Neighborhoods. It was developed by a developer working with the building department uh, came up with that. And I, I mean, I wish they'd use a different name because conservation to me suggests kind of a mean, <laughs> finer level of preservation, you know, like um, conservation of fabric or textiles, mm -hmm. you know, restoration of a painting. And to me, that's really uh, kind of the wrong way to go because they're very interested in keeping the pedestrian level of a lot of these auto world buildings. And then above it is like, Creativity unleashed, and it's a very vibrant district. Uh, I think it's. Uh, <laughs> I'm working on a nomination of the Knights of Columbus building, and I walked around the corner and I saw it. I saw this group of developers, and they're all they're dressed, and they walked up and said, "Well, you know, this is kind of neat. You know, this uh, you can really see the flavor of the district or the area or something." They were talking about these brick facades that were saved, above which was every bright cladding material that you can see. And it, it's fun to go there and shop and go to theaters and drink and, um, Did it, in like Wallingford, I mean, is there anything that can establish just some design criteria so it is new building to go that fits, fits in? Well, what fits in, there's the critical phrase. I mean, there are design guidelines that are about, they're not design guidelines, they're imbued in the zoning code and you go through design review groups that are struggling to try to make things fit in. But the, really the way to go is through the landmark process of the district. 
conservation districts, they allow uh, the design review group to do trade-offs with the developers. But, mm -hmm. but we'll support your higher thing if you'll save these entries. It's a, it can be very uneven in my mind. And, uh, and also the process, I think, is a little less public. So I don't know what it means. Probably as, depending on the, the players. Exactly. Too. Yeah. yeah. So um, I just don't think it really is adequate. And in, if you're interested in it, I would urge you again to look at making a district and crafting the rules so that they were appropriate to what was important. And at the same time acknowledging, you know, what people do in their backyards, you can infill with little cottage houses, you can build taller, bigger, screened by trees. I mean, that there's lots of ways to save and uh, expand. Has you heard any discussion about uh, preserving mid-century modern in View Ridge at the corner of 35th Avenue, Northeast, and 67th, which is the Northeast Library. Well, the Northeast Library, the the land four buildings yeah. in that corner right. are all yeah. a particular yeah. example. Exactly, it's fantastic. The Theodora right. facade was just preserved. Right, and the Dokumomo group that I'm involved with uh, helped uh, sponsor that nomination to save the Theodora. And as you said, there's that fantastic library, which is the library sponsored that nomination. And the church. Now the church, because of uh, church and state issues, uh, churches have to nominate themselves. And no one can nominate a church because of the restrictions on on inclusion of literature. But, but churches being preserved as far as this, the chapel right. part. They recognize that in their master plan how important that beautiful mid-century chapel is. And so if anybody wants to go get a quick tour of the best of Seattle's mid-century, just go to that corner and turn slowly. It's just it's corner. 35th and 67th. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But there's no there's recognition a, is a, a this this is this district. Right, the mid there might be because the of the exactly. there could be, but I think it's going to take the community.